So we need the clinical value analysis committees to be focusing on their targets and their goals for savings. And then if they want something new and shiny on Santa's wish list, you know, that should come along with your achievement of your goals and your targets, right? So, yeah. Without supplies, there's no surgery. Without products, there's no patient care. Welcome to Power Supply, the healthcare supply chain podcast focused on helping you navigate the intricacies of logistics, purchasing, contracting, and supplier relationships. Each episode, we speak with healthcare executives, supply chain leaders, and innovative entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the loading dock to strategic sourcing, from buyers to the C-suite and across the enterprise, we tackle the real-life issues impacting the healthcare supply chain. Whether you're tuning in for conversation or inspiration, we're glad you're here. You're just in time to hear it from the source and stock up on insight. So sit back and plug into Power Supply. On this episode of Power Supply, we speak with Angelique Villamir, Senior Director of Supply Chain at Legacy Health, and we're going to be talking about aligning clinical value analysis and contracting, how to successfully identify and run initiatives to achieve strategic goals. And so they've been doing it out there at Legacy Health. We're going to hear a lot about that structure and a little bit of a teaser. <laughs> <laughs> you all in supply chain are not project managers. Keep that in mind as we tee up the conversation today. Hayes. You got to come in and listen to her. She does a fantastic job. You're going to learn a lot. She actually has a little giveaway too, if you want to uh, hang around for that and learn how to get that. But I learned a lot. She's great. So come on and listen. And uh, thanks so much. We're going to be right back with Angelique. Stay with us. Bam! I'm Hayes Walder. This is Gary Skinner. And I'm Justin Poulin. From the studios of Healthcare HQ, you're listening to Power Supply. Hayes and I are speaking with Angelique Villamir, and she is the Senior Director of Supply Chain at Legacy Health. We're going to be talking about aligning clinical value analysis and contracting, and we've got a nice little title for this, How to Successfully Identify and Run Initiatives to Achieve Strategic Goals. And, you know, really, in the grand scheme of things, value analysis is a fairly new process for supply chain. So no surprise, we continue to innovate and build on some best practices that have been going for, you know, I'd say still over a decade, two decades plus, but it, in the grand scheme of things, very new. Angelique, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. This is going to be a blast. That's all I can say. This is going to be so much fun. <laughs> I'm going to learn so much, and I'm here to learn from you, Angelique. So I'm excited to have you. Appreciate you doing this. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, Angelique, I know I saw this past fall that you had a chance to speak at the Wishma Conference, which is your local ARM Chapters annual conference. And I know they've shared out a lot of information about power supply, too. So I'm also going to take the opportunity to thank them for promoting the continuing education credits that are available through ARM at the chapter meeting as well and for your support. But why don't you just talk about maybe your background? Obviously, you have a background of value analysis, but also you know, why are you doing these speaking engagements and what kinds of topics, but what's your mission here? Yes, absolutely. So healthcare is my passion. I've been in healthcare for 25 years, actually a little over. I started on the vendor supplier side of the world and in 2010 crossed on over to the from the dark side to the, no, oh, I'm not going to no. say that. <laughs> to the light side. I don't know. I went the other way. So everybody always, that's, <laughs> those are common phrases. You're just, your path is a little bit different for the use of it. I went over to the provider side of things and truly, truly here for the mission of helping our patients be able to afford care. I mean, isn't that why a lot of us are in supply chain, making sure that our patients have what they need on the shelf but also that it's affordable because no patient wants to get that bill in the mail and it's 
super expensive or, or not covered by insurance because we chose the wrong supply, right? Yeah. Well, the rising costs, it's just such an incredible challenge. And, you know, obviously in the last several years, but also if we had a great conversation last season just about the payer mix and where does the funding come from and the strain that's on. So that's a great point. And a lot of people are paying out of pocket for health care uh, a lot more than they used to. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, well, I've always said, I think the only people in healthcare right now that are making money are the payers. And, uh, you know, they, they literally, they've got double digit margins and everybody else is suffering, including, you know, the, the end user being like, you know, the, us that are paying premiums. We, our premiums keep on going up. Our deductibles keep on going up and everybody else is suffering. So, um, that's the, that's just, I think the reality. But Angelique, you look like you've moved around a little bit. I mean, obviously you've been there a couple of years, but it looks like you were, it, you, frankly, you're in some really good places. But what, how did you end up out there? Yes. So I work for Providence Health and Services, Advocate Aurora in Chicago, MedStar Health on the East Coast, right. and now Legacy Health. So I've been, been around the world a little bit, but I love the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast. It's just the mountains and ocean are always calling me. So. I'm here for adventure. You ever have any rain out there? Yeah, no, it it doesn't rain here, so I don't know what that is. That's Seattle. (laughs) Okay, okay, I'm with you. All right, that's good. Well, let's talk about some of the topics that you, or what did you present at Wishma, and what are some of the the topics that are near and dear to you, and and then maybe we can transition into some of the pressures and the growth of strategic sourcing. Yes, absolutely. And I think like the, you know, the past 20, 30 years, the hottest topic was, you know, that supply chain transformation 101, centralizing all supply chain activities into supply chain. But, you know, like you just said, over the last decade, the hot topic now is clinically integrated supply chain. And for me, um, every time I go to speak about this, whether it's a GHX summit, Vizian summit, ARM, AVAP, everybody's wanting to hear about it because it is so new. And I'll say that executive leaders have not completely been influenced and grasped the idea of the connection with nursing, physicians, and supply chain. And it's really critical to make sure that in supply chain, we know how to influence and drive the need for it. So I'm out there, you'll see me on LinkedIn, like a crazy person, educating on it, helping folks figure out how to sell the idea, how to influence it. So that's why I'm speaking across the country about it. Well, I'm glad you brought up the LinkedIn presence because you do create a great deal of content on LinkedIn. So I'll just go ahead and give you a plug to go ahead and connect with you and find you on LinkedIn because you do. You've got a, a many great topics and you're really useful, kind of practical. This is what's really happening, not just high level conversations. Hayes, you sounded like you were going to jump in there. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. Well, yes, I was going to jump in there. That was perfect timing. By the way, yeah, you do have a massive presence on LinkedIn. I just looked you up. You've got about like 28,000 people. That's impressive uh, in this world of LinkedIn. But what I was going to ask you, uh, frankly, is uh, you, you look like you've been there about three years. You know, COVID was right in there. What impact did that have on, on the clinicians being more in tune, more willing to listen, more willing to help in the whole value analysis process? Did it change anything? Yeah, I think that, you know, I've heard it said probably a hundred times over the last three years that the pandemic kind of highlighted supply chain, moved it from the basement to the boardroom type thing. And it's absolutely true because now folks are interested to hear what we're doing. And through the pandemic, it was able to highlight that we were a big deal. I I continue to say to my team that supply chain is a big deal We're not just box pushers in the basement and people are starting to listen to see how we jump, how we solve, how we facilitate, how we connect folks together. And that's really, that's really what we do more so than, you know, just ordering a bunch of supplies all day. A hundred percent. We do more than that. Absolutely. And uh, sounds like you've done it, doing it very, very well. Yes, yes. One of the one of the concepts that you kind of were building out for me when we connected ahead of time was how to create a service line team concept. 
and and really bring that clinical integration to something that can be not only functional but but foundational, right? And so, can you talk about like who should be involved and and how to build that team culture so that everybody is working together and that you know again we talked about it aligning you know those those initiatives so that you can achieve the strategic goals. This is the beginning steps, right? How do we get everybody on board? Yeah, truly. And I feel like when you look at supply chain transformation 101 that's been happening over the last 20, 30 years, the the concept of that is as you centralize all those functions into supply chain, you now have stakeholders and uh, peers that really crave or need information from you and they need status and now they need follow-up because they're no longer handling it, right? They're they're focusing on patient care finally. It's where, what they need to be doing. And so with that said, I need to make sure within the supply chain team that we are creating subject matter experts, right? So your SMEs at the helm to drive the concept, but to also drive that need for category management, So what I think about, first of all, is I am a strategic sourcing and contracting administrator, or I am a buyer, or I work in clinical value analysis, or I'm even an analyst, making sure that I am supporting a category or a function so I can become a SME in that, I feel like that is really important. So, and, and then with that, there's, there's an entire structure with what that looks like. So here at Legacy, we we built out a service line model that supports surgical interventional services, patient care and purchase services, for example. And then we have buyers, contract administrators, clinical value analysis, team members and analysts that then support each of those service line teams and then broken out into category management. The teams really understand that, hey, I'm working on cardiovascular and imaging, or I'm working just on general surgery, or I'm covering all of our implants. There's a clear structure for who the go-to SME is. And within each of those, those functions within supply chain, it makes everything not just easier, ease of use for our requesters and for our our stakeholders, but also within the team, there seems to be a lot more fairness. And then, hey, I really, I really understand cardiovascular now. And I really can answer a lot more questions to the team on what that even means. Of those categories you just named, purchase service, cardiac, all those different things, which one of those is easiest to start with or to get momentum with? And which one maybe is the harder harder one to work with and uh, where maybe the biggest bang for the buck is? Oh, my goodness. So you're talking about politics right now. So. Not necessarily. That was an open-ended <laughs> question. You took it there. <laughs> <laughs> because it all depends on your stakeholder. Some, some folks that would say that an easy commodity item like blood pressure cuffs could be something that would be an easy conversion. But if you're really passionate about your blood pressure cuffs, it could be a very challenging initiative to influence. So I'm not going to tell my team because they know it and they sit in it every day that one thing is easier than the next because yeah, good point. Um, we have complexity and all, to be honest. But I will say just emerging in healthcare today, purchase services is really I mean, yes, P- PPI, physician preference items, and the surgical interventional services world has a lot of dollars, but just as much purchase services does. And there's a lot of, of thought that that is what used to not be part of supply chain transformation and not centralized in the supply chain. And why is that? Because the complexity of IS or the complexity of, um, you know, consulting agreements and, and things in that purchase services world, that's not supply chain, but now it is. And, and how do you make sure that that's, that's functional? Yeah, I feel like that's really expanding out to indirect spend now too. So it, like indirect spend is the new purchase services in so many ways because I feel like with purchase services, to your point, there's so much regionality in terms of the contracting and the pricing and even how you evaluate the service, right? Because it is a service, it's not something you can just slap a national agreement on and know that you're going to get the same thing in the Pacific Northwest that you might have in the mid-Atlantic, right? And so um, it is much more complex. 
and I think that what's great about that though is it does require that SME relationship with those stakeholders, whether they're department leaders or, you know, in the operating room, maybe it's the service line leads, not just the OR manager or the peri op, you know, VP. And I think having an opportunity to maintain that relationship is really important because I feel like in the past it was like, chase this initiative and now I'm over here helping this department and now I'm over here. And we really just didn't have any kind of continuous contact to nurture those clinical relationships to make value analysis successful. Would you agree with that? That that's kind of how you're building your structure to tackle that? Yes, because if you don't have that alignment within the team structure from the get-go, then there's a lot of confusion within the team of which clinical value analysis committee do I show up to this week? Or, you know, as we're building out, you know, possibly a 12-month roadmap of what initiatives we work on, maybe it gets a little heavier for one person and, and not as fair. So you've got, you've got a lot of other challenges within the team culture, employee engagement, change management that's also happening. And if you think about like even just the change management model, that whole journey of trying to get somewhere from, I may be ready to take a look at something versus willing versus, hey, I'm on board, that whole influence change management structure. It really is difficult if I'm bouncing from from category to category as well. I mean, once you've got the momentum and you are a contract administrator and you're working on cardiovascular, for example, and you've got the physician ears and they've voted on something through a CVA committee and they're ready and have that momentum for the next initiative, you got to keep rolling with it. And if you were then to bounce over to food and nutrition or something, you totally lose, you know, all of your concentration and your, and your vibe. So uh, I feel it's important for the team. You know, another thing that you talked about with me was, okay, now we've built this team, we've created some continuity, we have a structure, but then there's always stronger voices that end up getting the most influence over the conversation. And, you know, quite frankly, traditionally, I've been one of those. So, you know, I, I know, I know what I've you done. You do have a loud voice. <laughs> I would have to agree with that. I also jump right in, you know, like Hayes has already talked more on this podcast than many others. <laughs> no, just, <laughs> but how do you make sure? Cause you're kind of the steward of the process, right? So how do you make sure that those softer voices have an opportunity to speak up and don't get muted so that you're really bringing in all those perspectives? Yeah, I, I, the, you brought up a really good point in the team because we have to remember in supply chain that we actually are just the facilitators. We're not the decision makers, right? And But the other piece of that puzzle is we are not the project managers of the project. We are just simply here to facilitate that decision-making governance structure framework that we have set in front of us by hopefully a governance committee of some sort at your, at your place, but we're just there to facilitate that. And so when I think about, you know, maybe a buyer might say, well, I'm not part of this process. Well, yes, you are. Eventually, once the contract is signed, you're going to have pricing falling out or POs falling out. And if you weren't there at, at the table to think about that and help to understand with the team and facilitate your needs from a buyer position, then the contract administrator will never understand the scope or what your expectations or your needs are. So what we do here at Legacy is we have these service line team meetings where all of the team members take a look at what's on the role on the roadmap, what's upcoming, what are we working on right now, what's an evaluation with our clinical teams, and then Hopefully, if somebody wants to say, well, I notice a stakeholder constantly buying this or they're constantly calling and complaining when we try to order this, those voices are just as important as the contract administrator, the clinical value analysis nurse, so that people actually input into the process maybe some information that we didn't know about a vendor or a product. And and that's very, very important. So we all need to be facilitators of the process. 
I actually like that a lot. But let's just hypothetically say that, you know, I'm a company and I have a brand new product and it's awesome. It's, a, you know, it's better, it's cheaper, it's all those great things. But obviously you already have something in the process and or it's already contracted. How does, how does he or she get your attention and or get it through your process quickly? How, how do y'all do that? Oh, you mean Santa's wish list? Kind of. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Yes. Well, you know, for us, we use our vendor access credentialing and control policy to really manage vendors at a, a hospital side so that there are not those rogue you know, sales activities happening. We really want to concentrate that back into the supply chain team. And as we look at our 12 month roadmap of what we're going to be working on, we say, Hey, we also have this other vendor that has a new technology or something local that we haven't taken a look at. And, and that's our job in supply chain to bring that person forward instead of the sale happening at the user, right? At, at the nurse or at, at the physician point where then confusion starts to happen. We do utilize at Legacy Lumiere, just like others. I, I know MetaProved is out there. It's going away. I don't know what's, what's replacing it, but we have a new product introduction process here at Legacy, like hopefully everybody does. But that's not the concentration of clinical value analysis. Yes, we want new and improved things to grow our revenue, but the majority of that Santa's wish list, if you think about it, is an increase to your bottom line, not any type of opportunity or savings. So we need the clinical value analysis committees to be focusing on their targets and their goals for savings. And then if they want something new and shiny on Santa's wish list, you know, that should come along with your achievement of your goals and your targets, right? So, exactly. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. Yeah. Sounds sounds like there's a reward system also, right? <laughs> like if you're good stewards of the finances and hitting those goals and making sure that we're working well operationally and that we're efficient, then it naturally creates room in the budget. I mean, yes. it's just a matter of order of priority. If we do these things, then we can have these things. It's just like your finances at home. If you don't pay your bills, you can't have the electricity to power that new computer or that new gaming system, right? So you have to kind of... <laughs> Okay. I might be speaking hypothetically. Jewelry, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Diamonds. <laughs> Diamonds? Holy cow. <laughs> we went from okay. I love it. Hey, it's Santa's wish list, and it's new and shiny. I think she hit the mark right on go. the money. <laughs> she does have a very nice um, office, I can tell from here. So, uh, oh yeah. yeah. So maybe she has a lot of bling bling in there. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing you mentioned earlier that I want to go back to, and I know we've got a, a few other key areas that I want to talk about, but. You mentioned project management that supply chain is not the project manager. It's not the decision maker. It's the facilitator. And you are sort of facilitating the process to a certain level. But I have seen a few health systems that actually bring project management alongside supply chain so that somebody is managing the project and then everybody is playing their role. I don't know if you have something similar to that, but I feel like for value analysis to be truly successful, that that's a major best practice, but I also don't think it's very common in the industry. How, yeah. how do you view it? Yeah, I, and I feel like if you are going into an initiative that needs a project manager from start to finish all the way to implementation of whatever that initiative is, that has to be budgeted at the time of you know funding and, and budgeting up front. And that's where I think we kind of miss the mark. A lot of times it's, hey, we've already completed the RFP and oh, by the way, I think we need a project manager now. I think that teams really need to be thinking up front of, hey, I've got this idea for an initiative. This is how much we're thinking it's going to cost us. This is what implementation would look like. Oh, and by the way, we probably need a project manager. This is a big one. So I, just for an example, we decided to go from Pictus to Omnicell cabinets for pharmacy. And, you know, making sure that in, inside of that, just the thought of doing that type of initiative before even RFP, 
that a project manager is there up front. And so making sure supply chain is not that project manager because we are not like we, I, I'll do the RFP, we'll get it through, you know, contract execution. And then what happens? There's no project manager. Oh, well, we thought supply chain was driving this initiative. So you get a lot of that and you just need to make sure that part of change management, once again, because I will say that a hundred times, all the teams need to make sure who has roles and responsibilities and where within an initiative. So uh, we've actually done races for large initiatives like that to make sure everybody understood what their roles and responsibilities were through. The what are races? Yeah, you, Can you, you define that? Yes. I thought yeah. I, you explained to me like I'm a four-year-old. What is that? Yeah. So it is a, it's a roles and responsibilities document where you outline all the tasks that need to be done within an initiative. You assign folks at the top and R stands for responsible. A stands for accountable. C stands for consulted and I stands for informed. So you're really just looking at all the tasks that need to be completed. Who is an R, A, C or an I? And it's very clearly spelled out on the document. Who's going to be managing what? Oh, I like That's that. Very and good. If you guys need a copy, just let me know on LinkedIn. I would love yeah, to that see might, a copy. That might be something to be a really good giveaway for folks that are listening because it would probably be very helpful. <laughs> and me too. It sounds a little racy. Oh, sorry. I just had to. Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> You had to go there. You just had to go there. I had to. I had to. All right, Angelique, I, I want to kind of tie this up in a bow because we've been talking about, you know, having a truly clinically integrated supply chain. And I think that a lot of people think that they have that or that they have made steps towards that and they very well may. But I think also to just kind of paint the picture of what can be accomplished is also a great, it's almost like a self-assessment, right? Like here's what's possible with a truly clinically integrated supply chain. And at the same time, it's a checklist like, oh, can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? So I wonder like, you know, as you kind of look at what can be achieved, what's on your, what's on your list of what this can really do for a healthcare organization? Yes. Well, you know, hey, we were talking a little bit earlier about service line structure. I want to just touch touch on that for a second, because if you think about system level clinical service line structure and how that could help to align, making sure that there's partners, champions, accountable, folks accountable for growth, accountable for revenue within that service line. At Legacy, we have a couple service li- clinical service lines set up, but we don't have all of them set up. It's, it's something that we're on our journey with. It is really helpful within a clinical value analysis program that you have somebody that can help lead or, or champion initiatives. So that's I wanted to kind of touch base on that just really quickly before I jump into your to, into your real question. So then within your clinical value analysis program, making sure that you're driving those, whatever you want to call them, clinical value analysis committees, councils, I've seen folks call them different things, making sure they're not siloed, you know, having 12 or 20 CVA committees versus six that kind of hone in on making sure that you're not running too many categories outside of the model so that you have to roll back initiatives later, I think is super important. I feel I continue to talk about that roadmap, right? Or that rolling initiative calendar of some sort for 12 months so that all of your nursing and physicians and your clinical staff know what's going to be worked on ahead of time. That brings in voice, right? You talked about making sure everybody has a voice at the table. The first week of working at Legacy, I heard a lot of, well, I didn't even know you were working on that initiative. And then all of a sudden there's a change on the shelf. And I would have loved to have some input on it. So making sure that you've got that that roadmap is a really good pathway as well. Where do you post that? that? I love that. Tell me how that works. And because somebody, you know, Tommy and Topeka is like listening to this going, hey, I need to know how to do that. So how do you do that? Yeah, so to create one, obviously you're going to be looking at what your contracts that are expiring. Don't I, a lot of people will say, "Well, I get fed opportunities from my distributor, my GPO." Those are all awesome. If there's some big ones that you want to go after, 
fine. The problem is you still have to touch expiring agreements, right? So we build ours off of what's what's upcoming and what's expiring. And we look at when was the last time we did a, a competitive bid or an RFP process, What which ones we're getting lots of complaints on, which ones we benchmark horribly on. And then we create this calendar that's 12 month rolling based on service lines. And we post that out on our intranet But also, we review it every single month in all of our CVA committees, just so everybody understands this is what we're working on this month, this is what's happening. And then we have site clinical value analysis committees as well. Because I will say, and people have heard me say this a thousand times, I can contract for the best price or best terms and conditions in the industry and have an awesome contract. But if we don't implement 100% at the bedside, it's all for nothing, right? So you've got all of these things where I didn't implement it 100% at the bedside. We're still buying a little bit of the competitor's product. We don't have that on contract. It's on list price. There's all these things happening in the background. So we created site implementation committees for CVA to make sure that implementation happens 100% at the bedside. And they also review the calendar and make sure they spread that out to the teams to say, hey, this is upcoming, bring your voice, tell us if you want to join the CVA committee for a couple months while we're working on it, come on board. And we've gotten a lot of volunteers to our CVA committees that way by sharing. and You're literally just marketing what you're doing and then people can say, <laughs> why wasn't I involved? But they can't say, why didn't I know? Right. Exactly. <laughs> and so just right. on the we communication standpoint, do y'all, do you have used Teams? Do you Slack? How do y'all do that? Or just email? Oh, yep. So we are a Microsoft Teams shop here, but we also utilize creation of Teams within MS Teams to share all of the information for our CVA committees. We use our intranet to share. And then if there's ever a product change or a product alert that needs to go out, we partner with our clinical practice support teams to send out those alerts all the way through nursing or through our physician partners. And that makes things helpful for communication. Now, I would say that when I think about that escalation pathway to resistance, we use lean operating system here. I know many of you out there are on high reliability organization or some sort of a lean journey right now. But making sure that you real-time problem solve before something derails and or canceled. Because going back to the blood pressure pressure cuffs for a second. You know, we have eight hospitals here. All of them evaluate every single every single product. You have one site that says, oh, I don't really like it. And they they not to say that they purposely derail something, but they they will and they'll try to cancel an entire initiative worth three hundred fifty thousand in savings. It's not always about savings, about clinical evidence as well. But you know, real-time problem solve and understand what the actual problem is. So sometimes taking a little bit of a step back is super important for the team to say, hey, what is the root cause of why this initiative isn't going well? And maybe getting like a CNO to partner with supply chain to help out with those things. I think that that is super important in the communication process and to turn things around and make sure that initiatives are running smoothly. All right, I'm going to go to that that final closing question again cuz I think but but it's really important what you just said about how to how to pull all of that together because if you don't have the structure in place then you can't achieve the true you know the benefits of a truly clinically integrated supply chain but like I was really impressed you had like four or five thoughts on what can really be accomplished If you put this structure in place that you have these relationships established, that they're both at the system level and the facility and department level. I mean, you're really talking about just having it permeate the culture of the, of the organization and also knowing your role, which is what I love about the races is it's really very much like, okay, we know somebody can't sit there and go, wait a second. You know, uh, that's not my decision. Like, you know, who's responsible. So structure is really, really important. Now that we have that, tell me where we can go with it. Uh, Yes. So the, I mean, I think that within our teams, we need to feel confident 
that there's a lot of savings out there. I know that from a supply chain standpoint, everyone says, oh, you know, supply chain contracts for the cheapest stuff and pushes it out to the shelf. That's not truly the goal of all of this. We use a quadruple aim here, which is cost, okay, because cost is part of it, but quality outcomes for our patient, patient satisfaction, and staff satisfaction. So we're striving for those four things at all times. It's not just about cost, but it's all the evidence you bring forward to it. So I'm A-OK with teams really wanting something new and shiny, but let's have evidence to say it's the right thing for our health system. And let's make sure that we are, we're coming to our common goal of safety, quality, patient satisfaction, bringing down our patient's bill, you know, that financial stewardship piece. So I think that having that solid governance structure or steering committee of some sort for that decision making criteria to help us you know, keep that focus off of new stuff, making sure you've got your, your CVA committee structure, following the governance, and then that change management piece. I'm going to throw that in there again, because if this is all change management. It is a cultural shift, kind of like you said, and everyone needs to be on board. So at Legacy, we did a roadshow. And it was our CMO, who's our executive sponsor, um, myself and, and another hospital CMO. We went on a road show and talked to every that. single physician because they need to understand that, I'm sorry, $600 million worth of supplies and services is not supply chain. It is everyone. Everyone touches it. So get involved. Get involved, everybody. How about evaluating your success? Is, is having all this communication, does it help you better measure and monitor KPIs as well? Yeah, I mean, because for in supply chain, the KPIs we watch are savings impact right to the to the bottom line. How are we partnering with our physician outreach teams to say that physician satisfaction is increasing, patient outcomes are increasing, you know, there's all that data that is out there, core measures and Epic or Cerner, whatever EHR that you're on. You've got to make sure you're plugging into understanding how how the program is affected and the success of it. And through that governance structure, that steering committee that you set up, making sure that they outline what metrics that they want to be looking at to see that, that the team is successful. Because as you said, with inflation, we could do it an initiative, a spine initiative today and probably have to redo it again next year because inflation and prices is going out of whack and it's going to benchmark poorly again and again and again. So, but are the teams satisfied with, with their choice and that it's the best thing for the patient in clinical evidence? Very, very good stuff. Really good. Yeah, Angelique, really, really great job. And, you know, I love the the level of detail to the structure because I think a lot of times we'll have some pretty high-level conversations on here, but really getting into some of those best practices, how to form that structure. And I definitely think it would be great if people reached out to you so you can share that RACES document if they haven't seen one themselves already or already been using that tool, because I think that's one of the best things that we can be doing with social media and podcasting and, and really just the networking that's out there in this kind of new world is to share those resources. So I definitely want to encourage everybody to connect with you on LinkedIn and send you an in message and and we'll go from there but keep the conversation going and thanks so much for coming on the show today thank you for having me you guys go get it and remember supply chain is a big deal it's a huge deal massive deal great job i really enjoyed it thanks so much for coming out That was Angelique Villamere, Senior Director of Supply Chain at Legacy Health and Hayes. Really enjoyed today's conversation. We covered a lot of ground at a really high level and also a very detailed level. I think the big takeaway for me is having the right structure and tools and consistent communication throughout the healthcare organization to be successful in engaging clinical partners to have that kind of integrated supply chain that you read about. 
You know, she even talked about what I thought was interesting, just doing the roadshow at their various hospitals and talking at all levels from C-suite down, obviously, to the supply chain at every single facility and getting everybody involved, getting everybody on the same page and doing it with a great follow-up communication. Well done. I really learned a lot. And I thought she, they obviously have a very good uh, program out there. Yeah, they got a great team. And I want to thank Angelique for joining us today, sharing her insights, making herself available to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, certainly feel free to go ahead and look her up and do that. And on behalf of Hayes and myself, thanks for listening to this episode of Power, Power Supply. Supply. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Power Supply. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing on your favorite podcast app or by downloading the smartphone app on your iPhone or Android. Simply search for Power Supply in the App Store or Google Play. The best thing about downloading the smartphone app is that you can access bonus content for certain episodes and view episodes in certain categories, like articles on the go and vendor spotlights. Are you following us on LinkedIn or Facebook yet? If you are and you love an episode or post, then let your social network know about it. Like, comment, or share our posts along with your thoughts and keep the conversation going. If you have any topics or guests that you would like to recommend for a future episode, just send us an email to info at powersupplymedia.net. We look forward to hearing from you.